options? Any reflections? Suggestions about the direction which we start at the beginning and the story is Yeah. That's a direction. I mean, you know, I say it's a lack of direction. Well, look at all. What's the, then what will be the next next decision that I have? When to stop. Who are the reader? Right. Yeah. Well, then. I'll read El Spidey. You're on. Okay. Well, it's all Okay, we got it done. Great. Same ancient rule. You all stop when you want. Stop. <laughs> um, we're, re we're reading the Thomas Taylor. Okay. Okay. So. Final wisdom. Then we'll look for differences from the other translation. Yeah. Why not? the reader. <laughs> you wonder, I expect, O son of Clinius, that I, who was your first lover, and the only one who has not left you now, the others have cooled, and that while they were crowding to converse with you, I, for all these years, never even addressed you. It was no human reason which prevented me, but a certain angelic opposition, the force of which you will someday understand. But now, since it no longer opposes, I have come to you, as you see, and I am full of hope that for the future, too, it will not oppose. And so, in the meantime, my observation has given me a pretty clear idea of your attitude toward your lovers. For though they were many and noble, there is not one who has not made his escape, completely disgusted by your arrogance. <laughs> And the reason for this, and the reason of this overweening pride of yours, I wish to relate. You say that you are inferior to no man in any respect, for your natural advantages, beginning with your body and ending with your soul, are so abundant that you lack nothing. For in the first place, you think that you are the most good-looking and the tallest of all, and as uh -huh. to this, it is clear to all who have eyes to see that you are not mistaken. Next, that you are the proudest, you are of the proudest family in your own state, which is the greatest in Greece. And further, that you have numerous and most illustrious friends on your father's side who would assist you in any need, 
and that those on your mother's side are neither fewer nor less distinguished. But greater than all these together is the power which you think we derive from Pericles, the son of Xanthippus, whom your father left guardian of yourself and your brother. For he can do what he wishes, not only in this state, but in all of Hellas, and among many mighty foreign nations. And I will add, too, because you are one of the rich, though you seem to me to pride yourself least in, on this account, boasting yourself for all these reasons, you have outdone your lovers, and they, in their inferiority, were overcome. And this fact did not escape you. Wherefore, I know well that you are wondering what considerations consideration causes me not to withdraw my love from you, and in what hope I remain when the others have fled. Perhaps, Socrates, you are not aware that you have anticipated me a little. For I had it in mind to come up to you and ask you these very questions. What do you want? And with what hope are you plaguing me, always being most careful to be present wherever I am? For I really do wonder what your object can be, and you should greatly like to know. You will listen to me, I suppose, eagerly, if, as you say, you are anxious to know what is on my mind, what is in my mind. And I am speaking to one who will hear and will not go away. Well, certainly. Take care, for it would not be anything remarkable if, just as I began with difficulties, I might find it difficult to stop. My dear sir, stay on. I shall listen. Then it must be said, and although it is hard for a lover to attack a man who is so superior to his lovers, yet I must dare to speak my mind. Poor Alcibiades, if I had seen you content with the advantages which I have just retailed, and thinking that you ought to pass your life in the enjoyment of them, I should long ago have ceased to love you, at least so I persuade myself. But now I will prove that you have other thoughts in regard to yourself, and thus you will know that my attention has been continually directed towards you. For it seems to me that if one of the gods were to say, Alcibiades, do you wish to live possessing that which now is yours, or to die immediately, if you may not acquire greater things? It seems to me that you would choose death. But now I will point out to you the nature of the hope in which you are living. For you think that if you appear shortly before the Athenian people, <clears throat> and this will happen in a few days, that at this appearance you will be able to prove to them that you are worthy to be honored as neither Pericles nor any of his predecessors was ever before honored. And, having demonstrated this, you imagine that you will have the greatest power in the state, and if therein the greatest among the rest of the Greeks, and if therein the greatest among the rest of the Greeks, and not only among them, but among all the barbarians who inhabit the same continent with us, and if the same God were to say to you that you were to hold lordship here in Europe, but that it, is, it was not permitted to you to cross over into Asia and employ yourself in affairs there, it seems to me that you would not wish to live even on, those, on these limited terms, unless you could, so to say, fill the ears of all men with your name and your power. And I believe that you think, I believe you think that no man worthy worth speaking of ever lived except Cyrus and Xerxes, and that you cherish this hope I know well, and am not speaking merely from conjecture. Now perhaps you may say, knowing that I am telling the truth, yes, Socrates, but what has this to do with the reason which you said you would tell me of your not deserting me? Deserting me. I will tell you, dear son of Clinias and Dino Machi, that it is impossible for all these ideas of yours to be brought to their consummation without my help. So great is the power which I believe myself to have in regard to your affairs <coughs> and yourself. And it was because of this that I have long thought that the God would not permit me to converse with you, so that I waited until he should permit. For just as you cherish ho hopes, that you will demonstrate to the state that you are worth everything to it, and that, when you have proved this, there will be nothing which you will not at once be able to do. So do I hope that I shall possess the greatest power over you when I have proved that I am worth everything to you, and that neither guardian, guardian nor relation, nor anyone else is able to procure you the power.
power you desire so eagerly, but I only, that is with the help of God. While you were younger, therefore, and before you were filled with this mighty hope, the God, it seems to me, did not permit me to discourse with you, lest my discourse should be in vain. But now he has permitted it, and now you will listen. You appear to me, Socrates, to be much more eccentric now you have begun to speak than when you followed me And yet, even then you had a very strange appearance. <laughs> Whether I have these ideas or not, you have apparently decided, and if I deny it, I shall not be the least likely to convince you. Let it be so then. But even if I have such intentions in the most extreme degree, how can they be accomplished through you, but not without you? Can you tell me? Are you asking me if I have some <laughs> long harangue to make, such as you are you are accustomed to hear? For I have no powers in that direction. But I should be able, I think, to prove to you that this is the case, if you would be willing to give me one, and only one, small service. If, if you mean some service that is not difficult, I am willing. Does it seem difficult to you to answer questions? <laughs> not difficult. Then answer. Ask. Am I to ask on the supposition that you have the intentions which I assert that you have? Yes, so, if you wish, so that I may know what you will say. I used to call it stop there. I think that sentence is very significant the way it is expressed. Because he doesn't really answer the question. That's the character. He doesn't yeah. say, he doesn't say, do you have the intentions? I mean, it says on the supposition, but he could have said yes, but he says, if you wish, so that I can find out what you want to say. It's, I think that's a good point in the dialogue. I have nothing else to say with that. <laughs> How many less there's some other response? Okay, shall we go on? If you wish. Okay. Well then, you intend in a short time to present yourself before the Athenians in order to give them some advice. If then, just as you were about to mount the bema, I were to take hold of your arm and say, Alcibiades, since the Athenians <laughs> intend to deliberate on some question, are you getting up to give them advice? And is it because the question is one of which your knowledge is better than theirs? What would you reply? I should say, of course, because it, because it is one about which I know is better than yours. <clears throat> on those matters which you happen to know, then are you a good counselor? And you know those things only which you have learned from others or found out for yourself? What other things could I know? Is it possible then that you could have could ever have learned or discovered anything if you had not been willing either to learn or to find out for yourself? It is not. How? Would you have been willing to seek out or learn things which you thought you knew? Of course not. And was there a time when you did not cons consider yourself to know that which you may now know? Well, there must have been. But I too know tolerably well what you have learned. If there is anything that I have forgotten, tell me. For according to my recollection, you have learned the arts of writing, playing on the lyre, and wrestling. For the flute you would not learn. This is the extent of your knowledge, unless you have secretly learned something of which I am not aware. Though I hardly think that you could have gone into or come out of your house by night or day without my knowing of it. No, that is the range of my learning. Then when the Athenians <coughs> deliberate, deliberate about their alphabet and consider how they may write it correctly, will you arise and give them the benefit of your advice? Not I, Jesus. Possibly when they deliberate about the notes of the lyre? Never. And they are not in the habit of deliberating about wrestling throws in the assembly. Of course not. Then on what subject of their deliberation will you advise them? Surely not about building. Certainly not. For in this matter, a builder will advise them better than you will. Yes. Nor when they deliberate about divination? No. For again, a diviner would be better than you. Yes. And. And that, whether he were short or tall, good-looking or ugly, noble or ignoble. How otherwise? For I suppose that good advice upon any subject is to be had from a man because of his knowledge of it, 
and not because of his riches. Assuredly. And it will make no difference to the Athenians whether their advisor be rich or poor when they are deliberating about the public health of the city, but they will seek for a physician with whom to consult. Then what will be the subject of their investigation upon which you will be just justified in arising to give them advice? When they deliberate about their own affairs, Socrates. Do you mean about shipbuilding, what sort of ships they should build? I do not, Socrates. For I suppose you have no knowledge of shipbuilding. Is that the reason, or some other? <laughs> then what affairs of their own do you mean? I mean, Socrates, when they deliberate about war or peace or any of the other, other affairs of the state. You mean then when they deliberate as to with whom they should make peace and with whom they should go to war and in what manner? Yes. And ought they not to make peace or war with those with whom it is better to do so? Yes. And when it is better? Certainly. And for so long a time as is, that is, it is better? Mm -hmm. Yes. If therefore the Athenians were to deliberate as to with whom they ought to close in wrestling, and with whom they should struggle at arm's length. And in what manner would you or the trainer advise them better? The trainer, of course. Can okay, you tell me what the trainer would have in view in giving advice as to with whom to close in wrestling and with whom not? And when and in what manner? For instance, ought we to wrestle closely with those persons with whom it is better to do so or not? Yeah. And as much as is better? As much. And at the time which is better? Further, should not a singer sometimes accompany his song with the lyre and with movement? Yes, he should. And this one it is better to do so? Yes. And as much as is better? I agree. Well then, since you use the term better in both cases, in accompanying a song and a lyre and in close wrestling, what do you call better in playing the lyre? As I call the excellence of wrestling gymnastical, but what do you call the other? I do not understand. Then try to copy me, for I should answer, that which is right in every respect, that which is right being, of course, that which is according to the rules of the art, is it not? Yes. But was not the, the art that of gymnastic? What else? And I said that the excellence of wrestling was gymnastical. You did. And was I not right? Come then, tell me, for you know, you too should be able to reason correctly. First, what is the art to which harp playing, singing, and choreo choreography belong? What is the art called as a whole? Are you still unable to say? I am, indeed. Try in this way then. Who are the goddesses whose art it is? I do. Consider now, has the art any name derived from them? I believe in music. I do. What then is that which is rightly performed according to this art? Just as I said that in the other case, that which was right according to the rules of the art was gymnastical, what would you say in this case? How is it to be performed? Oh, it's music. Excellent reply. Well then, what name do you give to the better in making war or peace? just as in the other examples you use the word better in each case, referring in the one to that which was more musical, and in the other to more gymnastical. Try now, try now to name the better in these cases. But I'm quite unable to do so. Yet surely this would be disgraceful. If when you were speaking and giving advice on the matter of foodstuffs, that this food was better than that, and at such a time, and in such a quantity. Someone were to ask you, what do you mean by better, Alcibiades? And you could reply that you meant more wholesome, although you do not pretend to be a physician, but in a manner of which you pre pretend to have knowledge, and about which you are about to get up and advise as if you knew, would you not be ashamed if the same question were put, and you could make no reply? It would look shameful, would it not? Certainly. And consider and try to say, what is the aim of that which is better in making peace or war with the proper persons? I have thought, and I cannot perceive what it is. 
Do you not know that when we make war, both parties charge the other with inflicting some injury when they come to the point of fighting, and that they give it a name? Of course I do. We say that we have been deceived, have suffered violence, or have been wrong. Now how do we say that we have suffered each of these injuries? Try to tell me, what is the difference, this way or that? And by this way, Socrates, do you mean justly or unjustly? The very thing. Indeed, the two are completely and utterly different. Well then, against whom will you advise the Athenians to make war, the unjust or the doers of justice? That is a strange question to ask. For even if a man did conceive the thought that it was necessary to go to war with the doers of justice, he would not confess it. For that, it seems, is not lawful. Certainly not, nor does it seem to be honorable. Then you will have in view these considerations, and what is just when you make your speeches. Only necessarily. Then is the better, about which I asked you just now in the case of going to war or refraining from it, and with whom to do so, and with whom not, and when and when not, anything but the more just or not. I so. How is this then, my dear Alcibiades? Has it escaped your notice that you did not know this? Or has it escaped my notice that you have learnt it, and have gone to a teacher who no. taught you to distinguish between the just and the unjust? And who is he? Oh. Share your secret that you may introduce no. me also as a frequent no. teacher no. school. No. Just in Socrates. No, by the God of our common friendship, by whom I would never swear falsely. If you have a teacher, tell me who he is. What if I have not? Do you think there is no other way in which I may have gained knowledge of the just and the unjust? There is. You might have discovered it yourself. But you think I should not be capable of discovering it? I think you would be most capable if you had sought for it. Do you imagine, then, that I have never sought for it? I do, if you imagine that you did not know them. And there was not a time when I was not in that condition? Yeah. Was there not a time when I was in that condition? Very good. Then you can tell me when the time was when you did not think you knew what is just and unjust. Then can you tell me when the time was when you did not think you knew what is just and unjust? Come. A year ago, were you seeking, and did you think that you did not know, or that you did? And please answer truly, that our discussion may not be in vain. Mm, I thought I knew. And two, uh, three, four years ago, was it not so? Mm, it was. Yet before that, you were a boy, were you not? Yes. And then I'm quite sure that you thought you knew. Why are you quite sure? I have often heard you when you were a boy, in the schools and elsewhere, and when you were playing at dice or some other game, not as if you had any doubt about what was just and unjust, but proclaiming very loudly with the utmost confidence that someone or the, someone or other of the boys was wicked and unjust, and the, ma and the manner of his injustice. Is not what I say true? But what was I to do, Socrates, when one of them did me an act of injustice? But if you had happened at that time to be ignorant whether you were being unjustly treated or not, would you say, what am I to do? By Zeus, I was not ignorant. I clearly knew that I was being treated unjustly. It seems then, even as a boy, you thought you knew what was just and what unjust. I did think so, and I knew it too. At what time did you discover it? Surely not while you thought you knew. Mm, certainly not. <clears throat> then when did you think that you were ignorant? <clears throat> Consider, for you will not find that time. I no, by the Socrates I cannot say. Then you did not learn them by discovering them. I certainly do not appear to have done so. But you said just now that you did not know them by having learned them. And if you have neither discovered or learn them, how and whence do you know them? Possibly I did not answer you correctly when I said that I knew them by discovering them myself. How then? Uh, I think I learned them as others do. Uh, we come again to the same question. From whom? Do tell me. From the The teachers with whom you take refuge are not very admirable, and 
you refer your knowledge to the many. Why not? Are they not capable of teaching me all? Not even the right and the wrong way to play draughts. And yet I think that is of less importance than justice, huh? Do you, th do you not think so? Yes. But they are unable to teach things of less importance, but able to teach those of greater. Personally, I think so. But at any rate, they are able to teach things of far greater importance than draft dra 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 What things are they? Well, for example, I learned to speak Greek from them, and I could not say who was my teacher, but I refer my knowledge to these same teachers who you say are worthless. <coughs> But, my noble sir, of that the many are good teachers, and their instruction may justly be recommended. Why is that? Because in that manner they have the requisites of good teachers. What do you mean by that? Do you not know that those who are to teach anything must first know it themselves? Must they not? No, of course. Then will not those who know a thing agree about it among themselves and not differ? Yes. And as to the subject upon which they differ, would you say they knew them? Certainly not. Then how could they be teachers of such subjects? They could not. Well then, do the many seem to you to differ as to what is stone and wood? And if you ask any of them, do they not agree on these matters and go to the same things when they wish to pick up a piece of stone or a piece of wood? And so with everything of this kind. For I suppose that this is pretty well what you mean by knowing the Greek language, is it not? Mm, yes. Then on these matters, as we said, they agree with each other and with themselves. Nor in public life do cities dispute with each other, some meaning one thing and others another by the same word. And they are not. Then of these subjects, they would probably <coughs> be good teachers. Yes. Then if we wish to cause anyone to have a knowledge of them, we should be right in sending him to the instruction of our friends, the many. Certainly. But what if we <coughs> wish to know not only which are men and which horses, but also which of them are good runners and which not. Would the many be competent to teach that also? Certainly not. And you have sufficient proof then that the many do not know and are not useful teachers of these things and the fact that they never agree with each other about them. Yes, I have. But if we wish to know not only which are men, but also which men are healthy and which unhealthy, should we find the many competent teachers of this? Certainly not would prove to you that they were bad teachers of such ma matters if you saw them at variance? It would. But what now? Do the many seem to you to agree with themselves or with each other about the justice and injustice of men and things? Why, this Socrates least of all. What? They differ most upon these questions? Oh, very much so. And I do not suppose that you have ever seen or heard of men differing to such an extent upon what is wholesome and the reverse has to go to war and kill each other because of it. Certainly not. But I know well that they have done so in questions of justice and, and injustice. And if you, have ever, if you have never seen such struggles, at any rate, you have heard of them from many sources, and especially from Homer, or you have heard both the Odyssey and the Iliad. From beginning to end, of course. And are not these poems about differences as to what is just and unjust? Yes. And the battles and slaughter between the Greeks and the Trojans and between Odysseus and the cities of Penelope were through this difference? True. And I think it was the difference as to the just and the unjust which caused the slaughter. And the battles in which the Athenians and Lacedaemonians and Boeotians perished at Tanagra and later that at Coronea in which your own father, Phineas, died, was it not? You're right. And can we say that they know the matters about which they differ so vehemently as to inflict the, the extreme of suffering upon each other in their dispute? It appears that we cannot. <clears throat> Do you not then refer your knowledge to teachers of this kind who, as yourself confess, do not know? I seem to do so then how is it likely that you should know the just from the unjust when you are so vague about them and appear neither to have learnt what they are from anyone or discovered it for yourself? From what you say, it is not likely. Do you see that you are wrong again, Alcibiades? How? In asserting that I say so. But why? Do you not say that I know nothing about the just and the unjust? Certainly not. But do I say so? Sure. 
How so? You will see in this way if I ask you, which is greater, one or two? You will say two? The price shall. By how much? By one. And which of us is it who says that two is greater is a greater number than one? I. Did I did not I ask the question and you answer it? Yes. On this question, no. do I who ask appear to be making an assertion or are you who answer? Yeah, I. And what if I ask you what are the letters in Socrates? And you tell me, which of us makes the statement? I. Come then, tell me in one word. When there is a question and answer, which it is who makes the assertions, the questioner or the answerer. The answerer seems to me, Socrates. And throughout the whole of our late conversation, was not I the answer? Yes. Were you the answerer? I was indeed. Well then, which of us made the assertions which have been made? Answer, Socrates, from what has been admitted, that it was I. Then was it not asserted that Alcibiades, the beautiful son of Clinius, did not know about the just and the unjust, but thought he did, and was about to go to the assembly to give a of which he knew nothing? Is this not the case? Yeah, you have something here? No. Then that verse of Euripides applies, Alcibiades, and you run no risk of hearing this from me, nor am I the maker of those, these assertions, but you yourself, and you accuse me of it in vain. And moreover, what you say is true. For, my good sir, the enterprise which you had in mind to attempt, namely that of teaching that which you do not know, having omitted to learn it, was sheer madness. <coughs> I do not think Socrates, such an Athenian, as any other Greek, often deliberate whether things are more just or unjust. For in these matters they think are fair enough, and therefore they leave them and consider what will be most to their interest if they do it. For I do not think that justice and interest are the same, but great acts of injustice have been to the interest of those who have committed them, while to others I think it has been of no profit to have acted justly. What then? <coughs> Even if justice and interest happen to be the most different things possible, it cannot be that you now imagine that you know what it is to a, to a man's interest and why it is so. Ask me again from whom I learned it or how I discovered it for myself. So that is what you're doing. If you make an incorrect statement, this argument happens to be capable of proving its falsehood, you think you ought to hear something new and different proofs, as though the previous ones were like worn out trappings that you will no longer condescend to wear. But someone must bring you a clean and unused demonstration. But disregarding your verbal sallies, I shall not I shall nonetheless ask you once more, whence have you learned? And how do you know what is to a man's interest? And who is your teacher? And I put all the former points in a single question, for it is quite obvious that you will come to the same answer. You will not be able to show that you know what is to a man's interest, either by having discovered or learned it. But since you are so fastidious and would find no pleasure in tasting the same argument again, I waive the question as to whether you know what is to the interest of the Athenians or not. But as to whether justice and interest are the same or different, why do you not prove it, if you wish by asking me questions, as I have asked you? Or, if you would rather, expound the questions in a discourse by yourself? But Socrates, I don't know if I should be capable of going all through it with you, to you. Well, why, my dear fellow, imagine that I am the assembly and the people, for there you will need to persuade, for there you will need to persuade each individual, will you not? Yes. And is not the same person able to persuade individuals singly and many together about matters which he knows, just as a grammarian sometimes persuades one and sometimes many about letters? Yes. And about number, the same person will persuade one and many? Yes. And this person will be he who knows about numbers, the uh, arithmetician? Certainly. And so in your case, on matters about which you can persuade many, you can persuade one? Probably. 
And it is clear that these matters are those which you know? Yes. And the difference between the speaker in public and the speaker in a conversation like ours amounts merely to this, that the one persuades men collectively while the other individually of the same things. Well, it looks like it. Come now, since it appears to be the province of the same man to persuade crowds and individuals, exercise your skill on me, and try to prove that justice is not always the same as interest. You are insulting well now, my insolence, insolence is going to carry me to the extent of proving to you the opposite of that which you will not prove to me. Say on. Just answer my questions. No, you speak by yourself. What? You do not wish to be thoroughly persuaded? Certainly I do. And if you said that certain things were so, would you not be thoroughly persuaded of it? I think so. Then answer. You yourself do not hear from yourself that what is just, that what is just is to a man's interest. Never believe anyone else who says so. I will not, but I will answer, for I do not think I shall come to any harm. Your insight is prophetic. Now tell me, do you say that of things that are just, some are to a man's interest and some not? Yes. What, and some beautiful and some not? What do you mean by that question? Whether anyone ever seemed to you to be doing that which was ugly but also just? I never thought so. But all just actions are beautiful? Yes. And again, what about beautiful actions? Are they all good or some good and some not? Personally, Socrates, I think some beautiful actions are evil. And some ugly actions are good? Yes. Do you mean in such <laughs> actions as these? Many men in time of war have received wounds and have perished in aiding a comrade or relation, but those who have not gone to their aid when they should have done so have come off safe and sound. Certainly. And you mean that aid of this kind is beautiful because the attempt to save those whom we ought to save. And this is courage, is it not? Yes. But that it is evil because of the death and wounds, is that so? Yes. And then the courage is one thing, and the death another. Certainly. And to aid one's friends is not beautiful and evil in the same respect. Well, one does not think so. Consider now, <coughs> it is not good insofar as it is beautiful, as in the present instance. Consider now, if it is not good in so, insofar as it is beautiful, as in the present in, instance. For in respect to the courage which it entails you to acknowledge that such aid is beautiful. Therefore consider this in itself, the courage required, whether it be good or evil. Let's see. Consider this in itself, the courage required, whether it be good or evil. Look at it in this way. Which would you choose for yourself, good or evil? Good. And especially the greatest good? Yes. And least of all, would you choose to be deprived of such things? How could it be otherwise? Then what do you say of courage? At what price would you be willing to be deprived of it? For myself, I would not even accept life as a coward. And cowardice seems to you to be the extreme of evils. To me, certainly. On a par with death, would you say? I would. That life and courage are the extreme opposites of death and cowardice. Yes. The things which you would most desire for yourself and on the other hand, those which you would least desire. Yes. And this is and this because you think the one sort the best and the other the worst. Certainly. And do you consider courage to be among the best and death among the worst? I do. And as to the aiding of friends in war, it was insofar as such an act is beautiful, being the result of virtue or courage, that you called it beautiful. I appear to have so. But insofar as its result is evil, that is death, you called it evil. Mm, yes. Then is it not just to denominate each of the results thus? If an action is called evil, insofar as it causes evil, it must be called good. Excuse me. If an action is called evil, insofar as it is, causes evil, it must be called good insofar as it causes good. So it seems to me. Moreover, 
Insofar as it is good, it is beautiful. But insofar as it is evil, it is ugly. Yes. Then when you say that the aiding of friends in war is beautiful but evil, it is precisely the same as if you called the same thing good but evil. What you say seems to be true, Socrates. Then nothing which is beautiful, insofar as it is beautiful, is evil. Nor is anything which is ugly, insofar as it is ugly, good. Then so. again, consider it in this way. Whoever acts beautifully, does he not also act do well? Excuse me, does he not also do well? Yes. <clears throat> and are not those who do well happy? How can they be otherwise? And are they not happy through their possession of good things? Certainly. And they possess these good things through doing well and beautifully? Yes. To do well, then, is a good thing? What else? It is not doing well a beautiful thing? Yes. Then it has again been made clear to us that the same thing is both beautiful and good. It appears so. And whatever we find to be beautiful, we shall according to this reason, find to be good also. Inevitably. Well now, is the good to a man's interest or not? It is. And do you remember what we agreed upon, excuse me, what we agreed about the just? I believe it was that those who do what is just most, most necessarily do what is, must necessarily do what is beautiful. <coughs> And did we not agree that those who do what is beautiful do what is good? We did. And that the good is that which is to a man's interest? Yes. Then just, O Alcibiades, is that which is to a man's interest. To himself. What then? Are not you the one who is making the statement, and I the asker of the question? Mm, it appears to be so, as it seems. If therefore any one person arises with the intention of giving advice, whether it be to the Athenians, or to the Peparatians, or Peparathians, thinking that he knows the just and the unjust, and says that the, that the just is sometimes evil, would you not laugh him to scorn, since you yourself happen to have asserted that the same things are both just and to a man's interest? Now, by the gods, Socrates, I really don't know what I am saying. But I seem to be in an utterly absurd state. For when you ask me questions, I am at one moment as one of them, and at the next as another. Landmark state, I would say. Yeah. Um, what do you make of this dialogue? Um, let me read something. Would you agree we can call a unit when Socrates and Alcibiades have an interchange? One interchange. So you are. Just to talk about it. You mean just, just question and answer? Yeah, one yeah. answer. Yeah. There are some bigger units, too. Yeah. And each unit, one follows the other. Therefore, there should be several connections, shouldn't there? there we should make sure that this connection is made. Uh, that is to say that. What Socrates is doing is truly picked up by Alcibiades, and therefore the connection is solid. And then after, would you agree equally well, as far as each unit is concerned, it too should be linked up. The units themselves should be linked. And again, the units between the respective exchange. Okay? Obviously, this is all obvious. Uh, would you not agree these units fit together into larger units these are the larger arguments which these subunits fit so there, therefore we're also interested in seeing how these larger arguments fit together right? Uh, the page numbers you have on there don't coincide with my page numbers. <coughs> That's true. I don't have the Stefanik page numbers. Uh, perhaps some of you have noted your book and I have it before we can relate it back and forth. I will. 
Do you, you I do? know that no. Oh, actually. <coughs> uh, could you use a little? Would that help? You just trade or something? <coughs> well, these come out of the it. Thomas Taylor translation, so I need someone who's marked it. So well, page 45 is, uh, that's where I started marking it, so it's 113B. Okay, 113B. Um, mm -hmm. Also, 113E. And 114A, that's all on page 45 in uh, the Taylor. Yeah. Okay. Then page 40 it goes to what page? I mean, it goes to what's the promise number? It goes say? from 113D to 114A. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. Page 45. Yeah. Is 114D. And page 47 is not on here, but... Where's 48? 48. There's a sub break there. Yeah, is uh, 114E. And 56, 56. I don't know if I have that. Yes, I do. 116E and 117. So I don't have. Do you agree we can take any other dialogues? Right? Like the part numbers, private symposium, many dialogues. Would you agree you get a sense for the distance between the zones? Like in the Parmenides, would you agree it's a very tight connection? Mm -hmm. Pardon? Not much distance between them. Yeah. They're not. Right. Mm -hmm. And equally well, these three, would you agree? Like in the hy hypothesis, it's an extremely tight relationship between those three. Would you agree in the Republic, as different, we have to search a lot of times for the connection. Now, how, what is he doing as he moves here or there? Right. And so it takes some skill and reading. We have to figure out how we make those connections and then we discover it doing that. Going into this one, right? we can look at any one of these subunits now. Uh, sorry. In these three ways. Do you have the sense, I, now just going by a sense for a moment, do you have the sense that this is just like those other dialogues I had before, and therefore it has that cohesive quality and keeps it all together? Or what would be your judgment of that? That's the appearance. Like if these were threads, so these shoes were threads, would you say the threads are tight knit? You say, no, no, they're spaces or I say they're tight knit. Well, we have to reserve, reserve judgment to see how the larger blocks fit. Right? <coughs> well, just for so you can go one, two, three, which we can talk about it in each one. Would you then say within within the units? Any one of them that you take, it's tight. Sure. sure. Let's test it. All right. Just jump in anywhere. Yeah. Take a look at a at a couple of units. Very tight. I Pardon? I say very tight. Yeah, huh? I would. I would too. Sure. All right. Okay. Since you did so well on that, wow. good heavens, you can now go for the next one. <laughs> Distance between each unit. In other words. Take several successive units and see whether there is the same kind of connection. Mm. Mm. What are you calling the subunit? I didn't. <coughs> Did I? You mean the one on the right up there? No. Distance within the units, between the units, and between the arguments. Well, the distance within the units. And you're saying... That's this color. Okay. <coughs> oh. 
Mm, why would you use a metaphor? Use a metaphor? I know, good heaven. We don't have to worry. Look how much, how easy it's going to be. Let's just take a hunk from here to here. Or from here to here. Then we'll be getting all three, won't we? Wouldn't that be a cheap way to go? Less work? Sure. And therefore, the better? All right. Which one do you want to take? Right, we have several. The easier, see that? Okay. Forty backwards. First of all, would you agree that there is that kind of a break? Let's make sure of that. Right? So we do it. Right? So we, therefore, perhaps we can pick it up from forty-four. See, because the thing I'm interested in doing is, would you not agree? There has to be a significant, see, this work runs like a bracelet, doesn't it? And therefore, I can ask you if you agree that the whole thing fits together. I'd be interested in whether or not there's some gem somewhere along here <laughs> to keep the image going, right? Or, what I'm also interested in is, is there any, is there any, undercurrent theme that ties it all together. As it were, a very delicate thread that might be difficult to spot, but nonetheless does keep all of the all of the arguments together. Which we can then jump to and say, oh, that's true. And then play with it. So Putting it this way, then, <coughs> I'm assuming this for the moment, all right? What's the thread that ties the arguments, ties, connects, underlies, or any other term you want? Do you know all the arguments? Oh. Or just in that section? No. Oh. So oh. it would be then some delicate thing that perhaps runs through them all, but may only be visible, but may only be visible at certain places. Yeah. Are you going for a bunch now? No, are you going for one idea? I think it's uh, the idea of whether or not uh, Alcibiades is, has to do with whether or not he knows, or excuse me, whether he knows he knows, or that, that um, seems to follow every, every argument. Yeah. I'm not sure it's just that. Uh, it uh, has a, a level of consciousness, you know, like, he, does he seek to learn? That, that aspect is, seems to be to the whole, from what I've seen. Okay. Uh, this is going to of course, what would this tie up and tie to later as a major stone in the work? Self knowledge. Know thyself, but don't record a little bit in the dark in the dialogue, wouldn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Which would go on with what Bill was saying. Right? Now, look here. Where in the text can we find that thread in it and in its various expressions so then we can use it? Okay, let's, okay, we, we go back. let's try that idea. Which how we for sure try that? 44? Oh. Shall we read, there was, they just went through that exchange about uh, uh, well, who was making the question, the question, the question 40, or the answer. Why don't we pick it up at 42 then? And just go through it. Since this is a relatively great one. All right, okay. okay. What was the step on That, we don't have a step on it somewhere, but it's, it's the, uh, the exchange yeah, where, yeah, probably around 112A. Um. You know where that idea that you, that what you say is not likely? Yes, that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to go above that, though, too. Okay. Do you not then refer your knowledge to teachers of this kind who, as you yourself confess, do not know? That's just a couple of lines from that. Mm -hmm. I seem to do so. 
then how is it likely that you should know the just from the unjust when you're so vague about them and appear neither to have learned what they are from anyone nor discovered it for yourself? Anybody find that one? I'm just the number one. Yeah, I'm going to put it in my book. If anyone has it. Yeah, it's 113 B. Could you read it first? Uh, it's like, and it was said that Alcibiades, the person of Pinius, did not know about Justin and Justice, but thought he did. And it tended to go to the assemblies of Pinius, to the Athenians, and what he knows nothing about is not that so. Oh, no, that's about uh, that's a little bit about it. Quite a ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, go down to um, do, do you not then refer your knowledge to teachers at this time? Mm -hmm. Two more exchanges mm -hmm. that after that. Homer, mm -hmm. Iliad, Odyssey, mm -hmm. references. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? It must be 20 different exchanges before that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right from Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. It's 112. Let's go to 112. That's an easy place to go. 112? Yeah, it's 112B. What does it say? The Iliad and the Odyssey. That's 112B, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah, if one questions the justice or injustice, I am sure you have. And if you have not seen them, at any rate, you have heard of them from many people, especially Homer. You have heard the Odyssey and the Iliad. There? That's, that's, um, yeah, let's start moving. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. 112. You want to read some of it? No, so, right no. Okay. But I know well what they that they have done so in on questions of justice and injustice. And if you have never seen such struggles, at any rate you have heard of them from many sources, and especially from Homer. For you have heard both the Odyssey and the Iliad. From beginning to end, of course, Socrates. And are not these poems about differences as to what is just and unjust? Yes. And the battles and slaughter between the Greeks and the Trojans and between Odysseus and the suitors of Penelope were through this difference? True. <coughs> and I think it was the difference as to the just and the unjust which caused the slaughter and the battles in which the Athenians, Lacedaemonians, and Boeotians perished at Tanagra and later at Coronea, in which your own father Clinius died, was it not? You're right. And can we say that they know the matters about which they differ so vehemently as to inflict the extreme of suffering upon each other in their dispute? It appears that we cannot. Do you not then refer your knowledge to teachers of this kind who as yourself, as you yourself confess, do not know? I seem to do so. Then how is it likely that you, you should know the just from the unjust when you are so vague about it? and appear neither to have learned what they are from anyone, nor discovered it for yourself. From what you say, it is not likely. Do you see that you're wrong again, Alcibiades? How? In asserting that I say so. But why? Did you not say that I know nothing about the just and the unjust? Certainly not. But did I say so? Yes. How so? You will see in this way. If I ask you, which is greater, one or two, you will say two. Okay. Now, hey, how did he go from a discussion on Homer to this one and two stuff? He went to that from the uh, statement when Alcibiades said, from what you say, to throw it up on that. That's the term right there. Okay. Then there's a point, isn't there? Oh, yeah. All right. Where would you draw the point between the two so that we can have the split? That's two questions. Um, at the point that Socrates picked on what he said, I mean, he, Socrates said, then how is it likely that you should know the just from the unjust when you're so vague about them, appear neither to have learned what they are from anyone or discovered it for yourself? And then Alcibiades says, from what you say, it is not is not likely. And there's a change there when right Socrates here. says. Mm -hmm. right right there. There's the change. Do yeah. you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's so the like change. A meta level. Right. right. There's the change right here. Yeah. He's, he's talking about the way he's talking rather than the. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, whatever whatever happened to this point is held up as I now pursue this point. That's right. Right. So look here. 
Is it like this? We're going along like this, and then he does this trip, and then continues? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's see if he continues. <laughs> <laughs> right? See, once we identify the splits, then we can talk about their relevance in terms of the sequence. Right? Or is it just straight line? There are no side trips. But let's go, okay? Back into this. Say, so, what's the connection between these two? What do you say the connection is? Who's the Would you agree we have those two points? Yeah. Right? Clearly, from what mm -hmm. you say, it is not likely. Right? That's the top line in this new section. Oh, yeah. Right? That's the from problem. what you say, it is not likely. All right, I'm asking question number three. We're now asking the question number three. Is there a distance between these two? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great distance. Great distance. Yeah. All right, so we can say, hey, isn't that interesting? It's a great distance, but what's he doing? Because would you not agree these sequences, how about the sequences? One and two. The distance between the units and within? Tight. Tight? Yeah, they were close. Then what does it do to you to hit this spot? <coughs> what, does it, what does it do to hit this spot? It reminds me what the underlying idea is here. It's, there, there's something about Alcibiades' state that Socrates is trying to get through. It's, yeah. Well, yeah. And <coughs> also, it Socrates comes back is to that bit chain. Well, it looks like Alcibiades uh, uh, is trying to slip off the hook at that point. Yeah, no, no, with it's what you say. It's what it's 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 no, it's not what I say. You're doing the answer, and that's the argument. Uh, so so you're not going to let that slip by. Oh. That's a good argument. Yeah, he slips off to the side. This is the. Yeah. Right. From what you say, we got to this point, not what I say. Right. So, what is this? Okay, then this point reveals something about Alcibiades, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yeah. Slips what? off into rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, it's, a rhetor it's certainly a rhetorical what? Dodge? What do you want to call yeah. it? Yeah. Put a name on it. Yeah. Yeah. Dodge is good. Face saving? Like, what kind? We need a name for it. That's yeah, good. he doesn't want to admit that what he says before was... It's not as good as this one was, on the Greek. Huh? Was this a conclusion at the end of 42? Yes. Um, well, yes. from what you say, it, uh, yeah, that's true. But he's always he's called him vague, hasn't he? He's always called him vague. Bewildered. Oh, he's a planet. Well, because he's, he's having to admit something that was the opposite of what he first asserted. Alcibiades. Yeah. Yeah. And... Socrates at the beginning of the dialogue was very careful about saying that he is re refrained from coming to him until it was at the right moment. So it seems like Socrates is being guided by that too, to watch very carefully that uh, Alcibiades is, is, is lawly and listening. You know what it is? It's a shift of self knowledge. It's a shift, that's yeah, a sudden shift of self knowledge. Or, Mm -hmm. by, by what you say, it is not, <coughs> by what you say, it is not likely. Yeah. Like his focus is on Socrates, right? He's here to he say, ah, I'm going to realize the truth of what this guy is saying. Now suddenly Socrates turns right around and says, it's you, not somebody. It's just coming out of you. You're knowing yeah. yourself, not yeah. me. That's what happens in this interval, doesn't it? That's right. That's what happens in the So, what's, you see, we can talk about this now as the first unit. All right? It started out. It started out with Alcibiades starting this one, didn't it? Right? We can talk about it this way, can't we? Right? Let's call that unit one. Alcibiades' is first remark. First remark, I take it from what you say, it's not likely. Right? Say. Right? Same, same issue. We can just say that he started out in Socrates. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, is he surprised by Socrates' rejoinder? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, what does that do to him? 
That pulls them into it, doesn't yeah. it? It keeps them into it. Mm. Yeah. Huh? It keeps them into it. Okay, then. Mm. All right. If we go through this, after that point's raised, we want to know the connection, don't we? All right, that's where we're going. That should do it. Watch those three. Now let's go. Okay, good. From what you say, it is not likely. Do you see that you're wrong again, Alcibiades? No. In asserting that I say so. But why? Do you not say do you that? Not, do you not oh. say that I know nothing about the just and the unjust? <laughs> Certainly not. But did I say so? Yes. How so? You will see in this way if I ask you. Which is greater, one or two? You will say two. I shall. By how much? By one. And which of us is it who says that two is a greater number than one? I. Did not I ask the question and you answer it? Yes. On this question, do I who ask appear to be making an assertion, or you who answer it? I. And what if I ask you, what are the letters in Socrates, and you tell me, which of us makes the statement? Come, then tell me in one word. When there is a question, an answer, which it is who makes the assertion, the questioner or the answer? The answer, seems to me, Socrates. And throughout the whole of our late conversation was not I the asker? Yes. And you the answerer? I was indeed. Well then, which of us made the assertions which have been made? It appears, Socrates, what has been admitted, that it was I. That's really, really. That's he's still right. really in the he's still doing it. That's a hard time. He's yeah. still doing it. That's a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. He's still doing it. From what has been admitted. Then was it not asserted that Alcibiades, the beautiful son of Clinius, did not know about the just and the unjust, but thought he did? and was about to go to the assembly and give the Athenians advice upon matters of, of which he knew nothing. Was not this the case? Oh, well, it seems so. <laughs> then that verse of Euripides applies, Alcibiades, for you run no risk of hearing this from me, nor am I the maker of these assertions, but you yourself, and you accuse me of it in vain. And moreover, what you say is true, for my Good sir, the enterprise which you had in mind to attempt, namely that of teaching that which you do not know, having omitted to learn it, was sheer madness. Uh, I do not think, Socrates, that the Athenians goes. and the other Greeks often deliberate whether things are more just or unjust, for these matters they think are clear enough, and therefore they leave them and consider what will be the most in their interest if they do it. For I do not think that justice and interest are the same, but great acts of injustice have been to the interest of those who have committed them, while to others I think it has been of no profit to the just one. Okay, so what happened? Like, uh, what happened? You slipped through. You slipped out here. Right. Yeah. Quoting the many. Yeah. Was, this, was this completed? Was this completed? Was this unit completed? Uh, did he come to a conclusion? It yeah, seems I did. So. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. The one where he says it appears, you know, maybe didn't he said know. It so. Yeah, it seems so. Then was it not asserted that Alcibiades, the beautiful right. son of Phineas? <laughs> mm -hmm. It yeah. seems so. That was good. Then Socrates responds. Mm -hmm. And what does Alcibiades do? He changes. Yeah. Look, who's setting? Who's setting the stage for the next section? Well, who's doing it here? Interesting. Right? Like her, no, wait a how does this how does this connect with this? At forty two Socrates well Alcibiades does it, but Socrates called him on it. Yeah. Yeah, here he doesn't call him so directly on it. But I mean yeah, he does. In this change. Yeah, he does. It's just a Okay, look here. Remember the issue we're on now? Yeah. Say. What do you want to call this? Continuous? 
What's the relationship between 42 and 45 now? The end of 42, remember? And the beginning of 45. Huh? Let's go back. Right, just those two paragraphs. Then how is it likely that you should know the just from the unjust? When you're so vague about them, that here neither do I have learned what they are from anyone, nor discovered it from yourself. For yourself. That's the way it ended. Now Alcibiades introduces, does he not? The issue between justice and interest. That's this issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that the issue that we now proceed on? Mm -hmm. How are these related, then? Huh? At this point, he agrees, so hey, that conclusion you reach, that's yours, not mine. That's from what you say, not from what I say. Okay. How does this relate, therefore, to this point? 45 to 42. Yes, 45. This paragraph that I just, I do not think Socrates and the Athenians and the other Greeks often deliberate whether things are more just or unjust. For these matters, they think are clear enough, and therefore they leave them and consider what will be most to their interest if they do it. For I don't think that justice and interest are the same, but great acts of injustice have been on than to the answers to those who have committed them. And while to others, I think it has been uh, of no profit to have acted justly. What's the relationship between these two paragraphs? First of all, would you agree the connection between these two? It's a it's a distance now. Mm -hmm. The conclusion of Ben Reed, she introduces it. Right? Yeah. So that's that's clear. Mm -hmm. so we can say a great distance between these two. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we can ask, how is this? Say, look here. Is this connected with this? Or where? What is? Which book? Which book? The. Uh, Transition, transition, transitional states by possible bodies, how they are related. Yeah. What I didn't know what you said. The, the transition, transitional state by possible bodies, how they are, how they relate. Uh, when he's moving off to the expedient, talk about expedient compared to. Where are you? What, what, what can you say? Yeah, I can't. I'm lost. See, the line that starts here on page, our page 45, which looks like 113C or thereabout, it's, I do not think, all right, this is Alcibiades' statement, I do not think Socrates, that these Athenians and other Greeks often deliver about other things are just or unjust, but these matters they think are clear enough and they go on to decide that on the matters of interest. Okay? Okay. I just wanted to know how we can characterize this move of his. It's a move, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He's introducing a subject. How does that relate, since it doesn't relate to what just preceded it, does it relate to the preceding conclusion? What's the force of this, what's the force of this new subject now? Well, it takes a spotlight off of him, doesn't it? Yeah. He he does. He's not admitting he knows something. He's saying that someone else knows something, or he says I do not think. But he's quoting the people instead of himself. Yeah. So the fact that he's, he's, he's discounting it. Good. He's discounting it. He says it's not. You know, so what? People don't. Not so what. They don't. We don't have to worry about that. That's right. Hey, the truth of the matter is, I and the Greek Socrates, Socrates aren't concerned about justice. We take that as something that's totally given. We just go after interest, and there's a difference between what's interest and justice. Right. What is that there for? Oh. The whole discussion about whether we have a teacher or not. Okay. It's not important. Yeah. Why dismissing it? It's dismissing it. Still go back and fight and stay on war. Right. Why is it expedient to go to war? Right. That's right. That's exactly what it's good. So then, how does that relate then to this conclusion? 
42? Apparently, 42. 42. He's wiping it out. It's, uh, then how, now, then now, oh. is it way that you should know the just from the unjust when you're so vague about them and appear neither to have learned what they are from anyone nor discovered it for yourself? <laughs> Not so Socrates saying, is saying, look, you're vague about those. You're vague about this question about justice and justice, aren't you? And you know what? And you know what? You appear neither to have learned them from anyone nor discovered it for yourself. Therefore, he's doing it at this point. I don't have to. Don't have to. Uh -huh. It's not required. He's a very arrogant guy. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is a conclusion, isn't it? It's a conclusion. You're ignorant. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're ignorant. In respect, you're still, you still think you know something, by the way, but what you know, you're vague about what you say. You're very vague about what you say about justice. And justice. You know what? You never had a teacher. Or have you learned it from yourself? Right. That's what you say. Sucks his own. I ask questions, you answer them through. <laughs> he goes by and he says, well, I'll tell you what, take justice, and you know what you can do with it? The real issue in politics is interest, not justice. I was just talking. Yeah, they're different. You get to 56, the right. Sagri's going to show him that's what it's saying. Yeah. Yeah. So then you can go to 56 and say, what does he do now at 56? He does the yeah. same thing he does up there at 113B. Oh, let's see it. Oh, then you know what we it's can do? In third, it's in the third person. It's a little different. It says, what if some guy as ignorant as you are about these things would stand up? You know, I mean, it's a kind of terminology that is directly. So let me ask you that. If you wanted to get an insight into Alcibiades, what might be a way to go? How do you respond to What? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to say? What does that mean to say that? How it responds after each conclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when he does the conclusion. What it does to the conclusion to, uh, to avoid them. Therefore, the connection between these necessarily is going to be what? A great distance, isn't it? Yeah, conclusion and denial. Because yeah, these are all these are all rhetorical dodges to avoid right. the conclusion that they reach. To denial. Interesting. Those are extremely once with. Uh, within are very close together. Yeah, yeah. Very, very close. Yeah. I mean, Socrates goes so slow. Yeah. Like you could literally, could you not, yeah. take a couple of these out and put them over here and, and look at them in isolation. They're so separate. So then look here. Let me ask you this. One. If this is a tangent in respect to the fact that it avoids that, this could equally be, even though it's quite interesting and continues the discussion. Right. So then we might have this dialogue maybe something like. <laughs> That's right, with this line being very short and all those loops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this can be very short. <laughs> the dialogue itself can be very short. Because <laughs> it looks like there are those two sections you have drawn there in the middle. Um, both of these are just, that's a continuous loop in one sense. Yeah. So it's like getting back to the original. Yeah, it's really tricky. Well, the issue of unfairness. Yeah. Socrates takes him with the issue of unfairness. The first transition. So we'll see again how unfair you're being. So he's, he's, he's staying. He stays with the question of justice. Even you know, within the tangent. See how? See again how fair you're being. How unfair you're speaking. Yeah. Is Socrates willing to take the truth? Go ahead. He's a philosophical cowboy. He has to go rope him every time he moves. <laughs> okay. Call him then. Look here. Gorilla. <laughs> if we now, if we're going to, in some way, characterize these loops, how is that then going to be related to the Delta Corridor? No, they're Because then, if you start. So you just said, hey, he's trying to avoid a conclusion. Right? He's doing personality characteristics only. And they may, in fact, lead us to believe that he's trying to avoid going himself. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Another way, whether it goes over in a certain perspective, 
So, uh, like at 56, conclusion of the interest argument. If, therefore, any one person arises with the intention of giving advice, whether it be to the Athenians or to the Caparathians, thinking that he knows the just and the and says that the just is sometimes evil, would you not laugh at it? Would you not laugh and to scorn? Since you yourself happen to have asserted that the same thing is about just man's interest? Alcibiades. Now, by the God, Socrates, I really do not know what I'm saying. But I seem to be in an utterly absurd state. For when you ask me questions, I am at one moment of one opinion and at the next another.